Welcome, my name is Matt Sillity. I chair the MFA in Comics program here at the California College of the Arts. This is the end of the first week of our, not yet. <laughs> This is the end of our first week of our 2017 summer session and the first evening of our 2017 Comics in the City Lecture Series. There. I'm going to get off the stage here, but before I do that, I want to introduce the person who's going to be interviewing Raina today because we have two chairs out here, so we're really lucky to have T. Bui with us, who is... Yeah. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say nice things about you. So you got right here. So, no, no, no. See, you're, you're a Bay Area teacher and cartoonist. Uh -huh. Your recently released comics memoir, The Best We Could Do, has received critical acclaim and is reaching crossover status. I wrote that. Do you know what I mean by that? It means it's engaging audiences of comics and fans that are brand new to the medium. That is how great this book is. So we're really excited to have T here today. I'm going to pass the mic over to her. Let's give her a nice big round of applause. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, everybody, for coming out tonight. Um, I'm really excited to have my son in the audience and one of his favorite authors, whose books he's read over and over again. Um, <clears throat> her bio is really long, so I have to read it, okay? <clears throat> All right, so uh, Raina Telgemeier is the author and illustrator of graphic novels, Smile, Drama, Sisters, all number one New York Times bestsellers, and by that I mean not just like one time, but like all the time. Uh, she also adapted and illustrated four graphic novel versions of Anne M. Martin's Babysitter's Club, uh, the series, and has uh, contributed short stories to many anthologies. Raina's accolades include two Eisner Awards, uh, a Boston Globe Hornbook Honor, a Stonewall Honor, and many best of and notable lists. Her newest graphic novel is Ghosts, which came out last September. And Raina, f luckily for us, lives and works here in San Francisco. I'd like to welcome and thank Raina Telgemeier for being here. <laughs> oh, I forgot to cue the hero music for you. OK, uh, the first thing, can we take a selfie? Would that be okay? Awesome. Okay, I like to do this to all my audiences, but it means I have to get up and then I have to stand behind T so she can be in it too. Yeah. So if you guys have a book, it's awesome if you hold it up in the air. If you don't, just like make yourself look the awesomest, most animated you possibly can, like arms in the air and just like crazy smiles on your faces. <laughs> Okay, guys, ready? On count of three, say CCA. One, two, three. CCA! One more. One, two, three. CCA! Thank you. <laughs> that will go up on Instagram later. I follow you on Instagram, and I've seen those selfies with the super cute kids. I was trying my hardest in the front. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So Raina, thank you so much for coming out tonight. I know it has, it's, it's, it's a rare treat to get you um, talking. <laughs> so thank you so much for being here with our students in the MFA in Comics program. Uh, we actually talk about you a lot in, in, in our one-on-one -on -one meetings. <laughs> Interesting. I don't know if I've told you. All, all, you know, all trying to figure out, how does she do it? So we're going to figure out some of that tonight, hopefully. Yeah, we're going to figure it out, all of it. Secrets to the universe. That's right. You'll all <laughs> walk out being Raina Telgemeiers. <laughs> <clears throat> all right. So, um, Raina, uh, books, books are such a great way to travel in one's mind. And then sometimes making books uh, lets you travel in real life. So uh, can you tell us about some of the uh, places your work has taken you recently? Yeah. It's taken me all around the world. Um, I was on a book tour last September through November that brought me to 26 cities in the United States and Canada. And I've also traveled all around the world, um, including to Australia, England, France. I'm going to Italy this fall, and I have a slide to show you one of the coolest places I've ever been <laughs> uh, with my work. I got to go to a conference in New Zealand last fall, which meant that, of course, I was like, I'm going to do the conference. Yeah, it's cool that you're flying me here, but I'm also going to Hobton. And they were like, sure, OK. So yay comics. <laughs> Has anybody here been to that set? It's amazing. 
it's 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 real. It actually, yeah, it's so cool. <laughs> I did not make comics in a Hobbit house, unfortunately. But you look so comfortable there. Yeah, it was great. I just I just noticed that you're there for scale. It's amazing. <laughs> um, so I mean, besides this, what's your favorite place in the world? This is this just feels like I'm playing to the crowd, but it's home. Yeah. Really, I, I left San Francisco for about 15 years. I went to school in New York City. I went to the School of Visual Arts and um, came back here in 2015 because my heart just missed it so much. And I realized that all of the books that I made took place in San Francisco. And I was like, wait, what is this telling me? So I came back. Um, and it's nice to be back. And I will admit that now I'm trying to write another book about living here in the Bay Area. And it's more difficult when it's actually outside my window. And like instead of thinking and dreaming and being so wistful for this place, I can just go hiking right now, which is not great for productivity, but right, right. it's good for like this part. Yeah. <laughs> so I think this is probably my favorite place in the world. And that is the opening shot from Smile. Oh. <laughs> did, you, did you do that from observation or from memory or a little bit of both? I did not fly in an airplane from that vantage point, unfortunately. Um, there are no real good photographs from that angle. So I had to do a lot of digging on the internet and finally found somebody who had taken that shot from a biplane. Nice. Um, yeah, I never asked for permission for that either, so. <laughs> uh, there's your Raina tip number one. <laughs> Um, so <laughs> all of your books have this very, uh, for, for all the thinking about travel and, and dreaming of other places, your, all of your books have a really strong sense of family. So uh, what was your relationship with your family like? Well, I am the oldest of three kids, and um, my parents have been Bay Area for quite some time, so we're a very Bay Area family, although now my sister lives in Portland and my brother lives up in Arcata. So I get along much better with my siblings now than I did when we all lived in the same city. Um, my dad is, uh, he was a teacher and then an editor um, for a tech company for a long time. And my mom was an elementary school teacher for 22 years. She actually just retired last month. So I'm, I'm now like entering that stage where I have different relationships with my parents than I did before. But um, I'm, I'm pretty close with both my parents. I wasn't that close with my siblings. And I was never really sure why that was. So a lot of the work that I do, I think, is kind of digging into those questions. Mm. And I have now written a book about my sister. I'm kind of working on a book about my dad right now. I feel like at some point I will do a book about each of my family members. Uh, yeah, <laughs> whether they like it or not. And um, Yeah, I was going to ask about that. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, even when I write fiction, I feel like I'm still exploring those dynamics and those yeah. kinds of relationships. So um, I mean, it's, it's as nuanced a relationship as any other, but I still feel really lucky to have them. Yeah. Um. This is you, right? And how I'm old the are one you? In, I'm the one in the center. You're the, okay. That's yeah. Like, I was, I was nine when this photo was taken. <sighs> okay. Yeah. So what were, your, what, were, what were your some of your favorite comics and books at that age? At that age? Well, I was just discovering comics at that age. And um, these were some of my favorites, for better or for worse, by Lynn Johnston. Still kind of like my number one influence, I would say. Fox Drop by Bill Amond was actually not in the San Francisco Chronicle, but my fifth grade teacher, Mr. Abrams, happened to be friends with this cartoonist who lived in LA named Phil Amond. Mm -hmm. And he brought me, before Foxtrot had even really been syndicated, his like Xeroxed dailies and let me mm -hmm. read them and was mm -hmm. like, hey, look, my friend's a cartoonist and if you want him to give you some tips, I'll send him your work. And I was too shy to say yes. So I passed up the, the, uh, the chance to get Bill Amond's uh, response to my work, sadly. So I was like 10 when this happened. Um, Calvin and Hobbes was the first comic that jumped off of the page at me and just grabbed me and made me want to read and draw forever. Um, and then we have The Babysitter's Club, which was my favorite book series at the time. It was just hitting the shelves and all my fourth grade class peers were into that. Um, when I was 10, my dad gave me this book, Barefoot Gen, a cartoon story of Hiroshima, which is, you know, really fun comics to read when you're used to Calvin and Hobbes and for better or for worse. True story of living through the experience and I just it just like broke my soul in half. I was so depressed and so angry that the world was a terrible place and angry at my dad, but like it told me that comics could be anything. It was such a powerful book to read and realize. 
what an impact reading a comic could have. And then finally down at the bottom, um, Linda Berry's work I discovered when I was probably like 12 or 13. And this was like the late 80s, early 90s when there really was no such thing as YA literature. So I always tell people that Linda Berry was my YA. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm, I'm noticing uh, no, no, soup, no men in tights? No men in tights. Okay. Um, I tried. <laughs> it just was not my thing. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know if it's the art style didn't appeal to me. Like It was really angular, and I really like these sort of soft, rounded characters that are very Disney-like. Um, or if it was just about like men's power fantasies, and those were not something I cared about when I was 10. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Justin and I were talking about this before the um, before tonight's talk um, about like where we where we accessed comics. So was which, was your access like outside of comic book stores then too? Yeah, um, too. like I said, the the newspaper for yeah. sure. Um, and my dad was a professor at San Francisco State University for a while, so he would take me to the bookstore there. And he would buy me the collected volumes of like Calvin and Hobbes mm -hmm. and everything there. So, um, and then we'd go to like Walden Books <laughs> and Beat Dalton. Mm -hmm. and the humor section was where I lived when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, I remember spending a lot of time poring over the Calvin and Hobbes too. Oh. When the when the strip first started, I was like, what? so good, so good. <laughs> um, do you remember the first story that you made that you wrote and or drew? And what was Not it about? Not only do I remember, but I actually have something to show you guys. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell a little story. When I was in first grade, my first grade teacher, Miss Stupenkoff, who's the best name ever. <laughs> our a real name. Stupenkoff, yeah. She that wasn't was, a real name. I was, she's amazing. So um, one of the assignments that she gave us all was that each student got a little journal. And it was sort of like a back and forth, like a QA. and a And she would ask us a question, and then we'd answer the question. And we went back and forth like this for the whole year. So I found these journals in a box a couple of months ago. And it's amazing to look at what a transformation uh, as a writer I had from the beginning of first grade to the end of first grade just through this exercise. But not only did I uh, write my questions and answers to Miss Stupenkoff, I also illustrated them. And in a lot of cases, I would make little comics. <laughs> so, so here's one of her questions. What'd you do this weekend? So my weekend, I went to my grandma's house. And here we go. Uh, we rode in our car. And then we got to her building, which she lived in Concord. And then we'd take the elevator upstairs to the fifth floor. And then there's grandma sitting in her big red chair in her apartment. So I don't even think I had read a comic at age six. But somehow my brain was already thinking in terms of pictures and um, sequence and story in this format. So um, then I discovered comics when I was nine, and then I started basically trying to draw comic strips. And uh, let me tell you how awesome my first comic strips were. Oh, I think my battery died. That's cool. I saw it happen. Yeah, there's my amazing comics. Um, this was sort of just like me trying to do for better or for worse. It was like conversations between imaginary mom and imaginary daughter who looked just like me and my mom. My mom's like reading the paper and the girl wants to go to the mall and she's like, can't you take more than one sip of your coffee at a time? Um, I mean, I was trying to write punchlines and I was failing miserably and I was just trying to figure out the format of a comic strip. So like, how does the rhythm work and how does the setup work and how does the joke work? I don't know what happened to the panel borders. Uh, could we do the next slide? I tried to put the panel borders in and some of my comics, but this was how I learned that it's easier to draw the boxes first and then draw the picture inside the box rather than the other way around. Um, and of course, it's also easier to write the words first and then try to draw the word balloon around those instead of trying to draw the balloon first and then cram all your dialogue inside. So um, I always tell people you just kind of learn by doing. And uh, so those are some of my first comics. I didn't really write stories. I just looked at what was going on around me and tried to capture it. And um, from the time I was in sixth grade, I started keeping a journal and illustrating it. So I basically have a comics journal dating back to sixth grade. And I did that every day until I turned 25. And I will never show anybody those yeah. comics. <laughs> so embarrassing. Man, such, I mean, that's like real discipline there. <laughs> you could say. I never thought of it that way, though. I just thought, well, I got to process what happened to me today in school. Uh -huh. That boy that I like had a, you know, he talked to me in first period. So I'd like draw that um, just like you'd write in a diary. So, uh, oh my God, maybe one day they can get you on Mortified or something like a graphic novel version of Mortified. If time, enough time goes by, I'm sure I'll publish it all. 
Um, so this, this is pencil? And what, what this kind of is pencil. Yeah. Um, the, the supplies I used to use, I mean, it was kid supplies. Like, it was crayons okay. and, and colored pencils and markers. I can't remember the brand name. There was a set of what? <laughs> It's this adorable baby. That's my sister. <laughs> we were both artists. And, and kids always go, oh, because th this is in the back of sisters, so they, they like seeing it. Oh, yeah. um, and so uh, these, were, these are just the tools that I used to use. And then... Uh, it looks like a licorice stick. Oh. Yes. Yeah, it's colored That's pencil. Right. Oh, and I show people that I was really apparently interested in drawing uh, Easter bunnies and mermaids when I was six. I mean, are you st are you still using licorice stick stick crayons? Or yeah, what kind of, that's how you do it, guys. <laughs> <laughs> what what other art tools do you use now? I am so old school. I still use like a blue pencil for layouts and a number two for thumbnailing and for doing the actual pencils, um, liner markers, mostly a brush. I use a brush almost exclusively for my line art. Uh, waterproof ink depends on the day, what brand I'm using, and then Bristol board. And I do um, scan my work into the computer and then use Photoshop to clean stuff up, but I really don't do anything fancy with Photoshop besides making the line art look a little prettier. Do you ink on top of your original I pencils? I do, yeah. <laughs> I think I read somewhere that you also draw your word balloons into the art. I do, but I don't do my own hand lettering. Okay. That's computer done. Still, that seems really committal. Like that's where the words go and they don't move anymore. So when you look at my my comics and you see that the word balloon's way too big for the lettering, oh. you realize <laughs> I'm not taking my own advice. Um, yeah, at some point I'll change my methods and make a, that a little bit better, but <laughs> I haven't yet. You make it look good, <laughs> I gotta say. Um, so other than drawing every single day, um, how did you start making comics like for money? For professionally? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I'm still not entirely sure. So when I was in college, I was majoring in illustration at SVA, but I took a lot of cartooning classes. And at the end of the semester, the assignment would always be just collect all your work into a mini comic. So I started making my mini comic as sort of like a class project that then spun outward into what I brought to comic conventions and sold at scene fairs and stuff. So I did a series called Takeout. Um, they were each 12 pages long, they were black and white, they were short stories, mostly about my childhood. And I did seven issues and managed to print and distribute about 7,000 copies total. So um, this was starting in 2002, so it's not like the internet really existed back then. Holy smokes, I don't know if I've distributed <laughs> 7,000 copies of anything. Well, I mean, I was in New York, that was helpful because the comic book stores there were all really receptive to mini comics, so they would they would take, you know, consignment copies. Mm -hmm. I sold some on my website, and I did cons. I went to Mocha Art Fest, I came to Ape, I went to SVX and Bethesda. I just started doing like between six and 10 cons every year and selling my work to people. And at the same time, I was drawing Smile as a webcomic. So Smile started on girlomatic.com in 2004, and I just put up a page a week, and before long, I had enough material to turn it into a book but um, I didn't have a publisher yet. So in the midst of all of this, I met the people who worked for Scholastic and they saw the minis, they saw the webcomic, they liked what they saw and they were like, hey, would you pitch us something original? And I tried and I failed miserably because nothing that I had that was original was really ready to go. But that was when they said, well, what did you read when you were a kid? And I said, well, I was a Babysitter's Club fan when I was a kid and they were like, ah, Ah, interesting. What if you turn that into a graphic novel series? So that's what I did. And um, the BSC graphic novels started in 2006. They were published until 2008. I did four of them. It was just kind of like a great stepping stone to what became the original part of my career, which was to get Smile published as a book. And then things kind of took off, off after that. Yeah. But that's, I mean, I started, I made my first mini comic in 2000-ish, and I didn't get my first royalty check until 2010. Oh my yeah. god. <laughs> I got advances on the books that I was making for Scholastic, but they weren't big ones. Right. But it took it took 10 years. It's like being a Christmas tree farmer. <laughs> you got to wait till the Someday. end. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to I'm going to use that an anecdote from now right. on. Like it's like being a Christmas tree farmer. Yeah. There's only one a year. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how old were you when you were starting this? Um, well, I was in college when I started the, the minis. I was 
something when I started uh-huh. smile. <laughs> I can't do math. Okay. Um, <laughs> my first book was published when I was 28. I tell people that. Mm-hmm. So if I made my first comic when I was nine or 10 and then 28 to get something published, that's, that's a lot of practice. Yes, that's longer <laughs> than being a Christmas tree yes. farmer. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're um, like the guy that grew the tree at Rockefeller Center. But. Yeah, like you grew it from, from a thought to a seed. To, like you tilled the soil before you yeah. grew the tree kind of thing. <laughs> So, I mean, it definitely paid off. Um, and, and you were pretty young, actually. You know, when yeah. you started publishing books after books after books. Um, did you have, like, other jobs? Or was this, like, your... Did you just jump into this career, basically? No. Well, I like I said, I went to art school. Um, and before that, I was, like, working at Stonestown. Um, and the first, like, interesting job that I had that I like to tell people about is that I had a job at a radio station here called Z95.7, Today's Hit Music, which started in 1998 at the rise of the Spice Girls movement. And, like, NSYNC and all that. And they didn't have a radio station, so they created one. This photo is from Halloween when I was dressed as Daria. And the bare naked ladies were in the studio that day. So like I got to take a picture with them. So I'm just like, this is the most 1998 photo that exists in the history of the world. (laughs) This was an amazing job though. I was um, a promotions intern. I had always been obsessed with radio as a kid. I was like a KML fanatic from like back in the day. And I used to call up the radio station anytime there was a contest and like talk to the DJs. Um, and so I had always been curious about what it would be like to work at a station. So this job came up. I heard about it. It was like, we're looking for promotions interns, which means the kids who wear like the cool jackets and they drove the truck around to like gas stations and we got to call up in the station and say, hey guys, come down, get a bumper sticker put on your car and you can win tickets to that Jordan Knight concert that's happening next week, the Shoreline. So it was, um, <laughs> it was super fun. It was just a way to like run around San Francisco Bay Area and, and be crazy and excited and with a cool group of people promoting Jordan Knight's music. I mean, that's what's more fun than that. Jewel was really big at the time. We talked to people about Jewel a lot. Um, I had so, that album. <laughs> didn't we all? Um, so after that, I moved to New York. And my first job in New York that I got while I was in school and then uh, it was being a professional Daria cosplayer. No, it was, um, <laughs> I got a job at a book publisher. And this was just on the online job boards when I was in college. And it was for a production intern, I think. But then I ended up working as an editorial assistant. And the company was called Stuart Taborian Chang, who is the sister company to Abrams Books. And Abrams Books, of course, is your publisher. So um, a lot of the people that worked in the office when I was working there are still there today. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, Yeah. it's really cool. So these were some of the books that I helped... um, do production work on. One of them is Alton Brown's first book. <laughs> I'm just here for the food, which was cool. And then uh, the most recent like job job that I had that was not sitting at my desk on my butt drawing comics was that I did um, one semester of comics teaching at a middle school in New York City. And it was an after school program that was just kind of like, hey, you get to babysit kids for three hours every day after school and make comics with them. We had a great time. <laughs> what school is this? Um, it does not exist anymore, actually. <laughs> it was called Quest to Learn. It was this experimental middle school. Get this. The curriculum was designed around video games. So like their math courses were about how to build games. And their writing courses were about like, you know, design for, for game ideas. And they learned to write code. And they learned to do programming. And they, they learned all of these skills, but they applied them to this thing that they were actually interested in. Yeah, it sounds like they were just ahead of their time. That, that kind of thing would be perfect here right now. It would be here and now, but this was like seven years ago. And yeah. it, I think it lasted maybe a year, maybe two. Anyway, so I got to do an after-school comics program. Awesome. <laughs> it was pretty neat. So those were, those were three of the uh, more interesting jobs that I've had besides being a cartoonist. Now you know. (laughs) Daria Cosplayer. (laughs) Um, Let's see. So you said you're a very traditional comics maker. Yes. Um, Has your process changed a lot? What's your pro? What can you just describe for 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 all of these comics nerds up here? Yeah. Um, What's your process for making comics? So I always say that it's really hard to talk about without showing it. So I'm just going to show you guys my process. 
So once I have my ideas kind of in my head and, and know what I want to write a comic about, I start with the thumbnails. I don't even write a script with just words. I don't doodle. I just jump straight to thumbnails. My ideas start in my head, and they come out of my pencil looking like this. So um, I do an entire book of thumbs. Sometimes that means 250 pages of thumbs, and I hand those to my editor. He's looking at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> no, I'm just in disbelief. <laughs> it's, it's not it's fair. A, it's a well-honed process. Um, so I do thumbnails, and my editor edits the thumbnails, but that sometimes means redrawing like 50 pages of thumbnails in sequence because if it's not working, I have to start over. But these don't take me very long. So once we're both happy with the thumbnail script, I go to pencils, and this is where I'm just refining what I have done in thumbs. So I'll go back one slide. It's really all the same info. It's just that I've spent more time on the artwork. And I'm always refining as I go. So as you can see, T, um, I'm writing in my hand the dialogue. And then draw the word balloons around that. And then we put the dialogue in digitally later with my font. And then after that is inks. And like I said, I use all traditional tools at this point. And then I hand it over to my colorist, Brayden. And he does all the colors. So um, that's it. Magic. And depending on the book, um, the shortest turnaround I've ever done was Babysitter's Club number two. I turned that book around in about seven months total. It's 144 pages. Smile took me five years from start to finish. So the process is not um, as refined as I would like it to be. Most of my books take about two years on average. So yeah, trying to get better. I've seen you do the the graph. What was it? The, there's a November challenge, right? No, there's oh. Inktober, and then something's in November where you write a whole book, like the NaNoWriMo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Say that again. It's NaNoWriMo, which is short for National Novel Writing Month. Okay, and you did that once, right? I wrote Ghosts. I wrote the final script for Ghosts in one month. Yeah. Holy smokes! And when you say the final script, thumbnails. Did it, oh. It was not a good month. <laughs> it was it was actually what? pretty Yeah. <laughs> but but I had spent, you know, eight years like sort of chewing on that project and figuring things out. And I had an outline before I did that. But the thumbnails themselves I did in one month. Okay, and when you say outline, you mean like this is what's probably gonna happen in the following scenes. But when I'm thumbing I tend to change a lot. Yeah. So I'm still I'm still kind of writing it for the first time mm -hmm. when I thumbnail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so out, outline like words, no Some pictures? words, mostly. Mostly, okay, words, not pictures yet. But words. they're really vague. It's okay. just kind of like a, a set of beats. Uh huh. So you just kind of think in comics. I do. Oh, man. <laughs> All right, so you guys who wanted to be Raina Tell me up at night, yeah. <laughs> Start drawing those journals. Um, okay. All right, okay, here's a hopeful question for, <laughs> for us slower folk. <laughs> does, comics, does, does making comics get any easier as you go? I'm going to show you a sad picture now, which is... <laughs> this is what my hand looked like at the end of my book tour last year. Um, after I had signed about 30,000 books, Scholastic was like, this is over the course of three months, Scholastic was like, could you come to Texas and sign 4,500 books in two and a half days for um, one of our chain stores? And I said... Sure, not thinking about what that meant. And what it meant was that I had to be KT'd from like my thumb to my elbow and wearing a brace. And uh, they scheduled me massages in the middle of each day. So I was able to go to like a spa and like <laughs> get a back rub and get them to like bring my hand back to life. Um, so this doesn't really answer your question, but this is, this is like the reality of my life. So th this is just like a fraction of what you see behind me of how many books I had to sign in those two days. Um, <laughs> my life is weird you guys so um it does because I've done it before and now I have the confidence to feel like yes I've I've written four books I can probably write a fifth I have a contract for three books at the moment from Scholastic and I have zero idea what that third book is going to be but I also have four years to figure that out while I do the thing that I'm currently doing and then the thing after that so, uh, sure, it gets easier. Yeah, knock on wood. I'm telling my future self that every single day. Mm -hmm. um, I'll admit, though, that the project that I have been working on for the past year has been a super challenging one. So I have been just like banging my head against my desk every day going, why isn't this coming out? Why isn't this going the way I want it to? Why is this story so difficult to tell? Yeah, that sounds more familiar. Yeah, so... Um, <laughs> 
sometimes you just switch gears. So I, I just like took a breather and wrote a totally different comic. And I actually like that comic a lot. So that huh. might end up being the one yeah. that I that I push forward instead of the other one. Ah, okay. The other one's a story I really want to tell, but it just might not be the right time to tell it. Yeah. I'm being super vague on purpose, but... Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you did that before too, though, right? You had Smile like coming out on Girlomatic, but then you had to do like how many babysitters? Club? Four of those. Four of those. Yeah. While incubating Smile. Yes. Even though it wasn't really incubating anymore, it was like getting produced. But you took a break, yeah. and then you came back to it. Yeah. Which is really why it took five years. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it is. Because you were like, <laughs> and then drawing with your other hand. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I should probably um, sign books with my other hand based on this photograph. I'm actually seeing an orthopedic surgeon next week. Yeah, so <coughs> awesome. it's time. Yeah, so I mean, if I were to summarize what you've been saying here, is like basically you've like spent all these years like building your comics muscles only to like jump into bigger and bigger, more ambitious yeah, projects. Basically, I mean, and my art gets more complex in every book and it's me pushing myself to tell different kinds of stories and tell them in bigger, better ways. Yeah. But that has its challenges yeah yeah exactly right so you have you did four graphic novel a four adaptations of somebody else's story mm -hmm. then you did an autobio comic and then you did a fiction fiction that was like loosely based on some of your personal experiences uh -huh. right and it was like realistic fiction you'd call it that yeah, right drama sure. realistic fiction yes and then you went back and you did another memoir about yeah. your sister and then you went into Magical realism. <laughs> so let's talk about ghosts okay. for a minute. That um, sounds like a plan. <laughs> Where, how, how did the idea for ghosts come about? Um, I mean, this book came about from a lot of different places, but one of them is just the place that we happen to sit, which is Northern California. And I was in New York. It was like a hot summer day. And I was like, you know what I really miss right now? Being in Half Moon Bay being where the wind is always cool and where the fog is and where there's these cool green hills. So I started thinking about the place. I started thinking about the people that live in that place. And I started thinking about ghosts and whether there would be ghosts living in the fog and stuff like that. So this, this idea has actually been in my head since, probably since before Smile was published. These sketches are from 2008. So um, anybody here born in 2008? This book's as old as you are. <laughs> just to give you a sense of how long these things sometimes take to germinate. So, you know, I thought about this girl and her little sister and moving to a new town. And um, a lot of these ideas didn't really germinate until I had a death in my family. Um, a cousin of mine who is only 13 years old passed away from cancer. And it was really hard to lose her and to go through that experience. So um, that, that really grounded this story somewhere for me when I realized... I know these people, I knew this girl, and then she died, and I, I feel like I still know her. So yeah. is that her ghost? Like is that, what's that relationship like with this person who's no longer there? So um, that's, that's a lot of like really deep and sad concepts, but I wanted to explore them through a story. And I'm trying to remember if I have another slide that comes after this one, but I'm just going to jump to the next slide. Okay, yeah, this is, this is me just kind of, before the book existed at all, just kind of looking at pictures of, the area and just drawing. Sometimes just drawing is really fun. Yeah. So yeah, that's up in, I think it's in Montara. Oh, you really captured the light <clears throat> of, the, of the place. I don't know, I wanted to do this book in black and white as like a watercolor style, but then it ended up being a full color book. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you never know. <laughs> there may be a black and white book in your future. I don't know, Babysitter's Club books were originally published in black and white. Right. Um, and then they were republished in color, and we just found that they sold better to a younger audience in color. And whether it's true that kids only read color comics or they will read black and white ones, I'm not quite sure. Mm -hmm. But <coughs> so far, this is what we've noticed. Yeah. Did I ever tell you I live near Half Moon Bay? No. For a little bit? Where? Yeah. Um, well, a little bit past Half Moon Bay um, on a horse ranch. What? I worked for a sculptor. And, and I lived in like well I sort I, squ I, I I squatted in an abandoned farmhouse. Oh my gosh! Um, was it haunted? I, well, I I wondered about it myself. <laughs> um, it turned out it was just raccoons living in the <laughs> in the <laughs> attic. <laughs> but yeah, I would go to sleep and like there would be a bag of chips that was in one room, and then I'd wake up and it was in another room. <laughs> so I did wonder, and it was a little it, it was a little bit isolated. Mm -hmm. Wind was very much a part of your life. And these creaky old houses had like a like a personality for sure. 
that's that's I think you really captured that. It's kind of like a character, the yeah. atmosphere in the story. Yeah. It makes your silent panels not so silent <laughs> in ghosts. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, what did you what else did you do to, to research the book? Yeah, well there's a lot of different elements in this story. So I I spent a lot of time reading up about Day of the Dead. And I mean, what I already knew of Day of the Dead versus what there was out there in published books, which honestly, there wasn't that much. I was shocked that there hadn't mm -hmm. been more writing done about this uh, tradition. So I did, I did everything I could. <laughs> I, I talked to people. I went to art exhibits. I went to the Day of the Dead celebration here in San Francisco. Um, you know, it's interesting. Like, they had a website, but there was no information except come. And it felt like, OK, well, that's the most important thing about Day of the Dead is you go and you experience it. And what it was actually like to experience it was nothing like I could have ever imagined it would be. It was such a, um, it was such a joyous evening. And it was, it was really about celebrating the past as opposed to mourning people who were gone. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I was, I was with a friend who had lost his mother. And it was just like one of the most profound nights of my life. So um, that, was, that was a great experience for me. Um, I <laughs> obviously looked at the area a lot and looked what it would look like to fly over these towns, which was also not an easy thing to figure out without doing it. Um, but I did my best, you know. And, and again, this was a lot of this was nostalgia and just missing a place. And I did a, um, a road trip up the California coast in 2014, where I stopped in pretty much every beach town between San Francisco and Los Angeles and just took photos and like explored and tried to capture what I saw. Um, I went to four of the missions. I think there's 21 total, and I visited four, and um, you know, talked to the people that worked there, and took a lot of photographs, and explored every little corner just to try and be inspired by it, but also try to learn what it was all about. Um, and even though these are just a setting in my book, you know, I wanted it to feel authentically California, and that was the reason for choosing to explore the missions in the book was I just wanted it to feel like it was this place for real. Um, so Cat explores a mission. And this is where she discovers that ghosts are real. And she's terrified because she suffers from anxiety. <laughs> and uh, so do I. So that was another thing that I was exploring was my own fears and my own thoughts about mortality and health and sickness and things like that. So then there's Maya, her little sister. And she has a disease called cystic fibrosis. And um, when you have this disease, one of the treatments is to wear this vest that vibrates. And it kicks the mucus out of your lungs because the mucus really sticks in there otherwise. So Maya's got this sort of like huge, bright personality. And when she wears her vest, she likes to sing. <laughs> so I always tell people it sounds like this. Ah. <laughs> yeah, so um, I read a lot about cystic fibrosis. And I have a friend whose cousin has it. So I, I had her read the draft before I submitted it to my editors. I do believe in beta readers. So I'm depending on the story, I try to find people who have some experience with the, you know, whatever it is. I just I just want feedback. I let my sister read the first draft of Sisters. I let my gay best friend who's Filipino and a twin read drama before anybody else read it. Um, so so yeah, the, the people who inspire my books get a first look for sure. Um, and I'm trying to remember if I have another slide here. I don't think I do. You have a question that probably corresponds with the next slide, so yeah. I'm going to stop talking. Yeah. Um, <laughs> are your main characters based on anyone you know? Well, I mentioned my cousin who passed away. That's her on the right. Her name was Sabina. And she was 13, and she lived in Florida. But her parents, um, they, they were growing up in New York, and her parents realized that they wanted them to be bilingual. So they moved them to Puerto Rico for about five years. And then they were like, wait, the schools in Puerto Rico is not, are not as good as the ones in America. So that's great that our kids speak Spanish now. Let's move them back to the States. Um, and as soon as they moved back, Sabino was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And it was a very aggressive form. And her parents actually knew that she was going to pass away, but they never told her. And it was super intense. And her older sister, Sophia, who was awesome, figured it out and didn't tell her. So I was really tight with this family when this was happening. I'm sorry if that's like a super heavy story to tell here on stage, but um, this was, <sighs> the characters and ghosts are not these people, but it's so impossible for me to extract who they are and who they were and how they inspired the characters in the story. So even when I'm writing fiction, 
it's always rooted somewhere. And uh, obviously the characters in Smile are me and my family because they're memoirs. Um, and the characters in Drama, like I said, I do have two very good friends who are gay Filipino twin boys. <laughs> so they're the best. Um, so they, they directly inspired the characters in Drama. I just changed their names and I changed our ages and that's it. <laughs> I love those characters. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, I, like anybody who's read my work knows that like, I, I go dark pretty fast. Um, <laughs> and then like, as a parent and as a teacher, I do think about like, what are appropriate ways to um, like, help children manage their feelings about things that are bigger than them, including death mm -hmm. and, and, and things that go wrong, right? Um, and obviously your readers are young, <laughs> you know. So I mean, do you, I'm wondering, like, do your readers like actually talk to you about things like ghosts and illness and <laughs> death? <laughs> I write really personal books. And when I write memoir, I do not pull punches. I try to get right to the truth. I try to talk about all the warts and scars and ugly truths about being a kid. And um, I think that's true of my fictional work as well. So after I wrote Smile, kids were emailing me writing me letters, coming up to me in droves to be like, can I show you my braces and there's a palette expander here and like I got this wire and this rubber band and like all of a sudden I was like, oh my gosh, we are, we are really having a one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> and um, that's one of the neatest things about comics is it does feel so intimate to read a comic and if it's someone's life, you feel like you know them, you feel like you are that character. So I feel like the kids who read my books, they see themselves so much in that work that they, they see me as their friend or they see me as themselves and they want to have that conversation with me one-on-one. -on -one. It has been so rewarding and so amazing. And going on tour for um, Ghosts was really cool because I met all these kids. These were two sisters who have cystic fibrosis. And they were like, how did you know about our feeding tube? And I was like, oh, because I've researched it and I know how this works. And they were like, wow. And then they like lifted up their shirts to show me their feeding tubes. So I've met so many kids with G-tubes that want to show it to me, and it's so cute. And I'm like, put your shirt down. Oh, gosh, my, this is, t today's my day, I'm telling you. Did you get that, did it fall down? Oh, thank oh. you so much. Oh, that's the best. Thank She's you. showing you her clicker. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll just, maybe I'll just go stand over there for the rest of it. That's okay, there's only a few more. No worries. Um, yeah, so that's, that's been neat. Um, I've met, I've met a lot of really amazing readers and I've met amazing adults who were like, let me tell you about my kid. I mean, those are some of the most passionate letters I get are the ones from parents who say things like, my kid felt totally misunderstood and alone in the world. And then she read Smile and she felt like somebody finally understood her. So I think I write my books in large part for that part of me who felt misunderstood when I was young. Yeah. And now I get to give something back and wish that I had that thing when I was younger. Yeah, that's an amazing connection to have with, with your readers. Um, it is. When they're kids, it also sounds really hard, like a big responsibility. I mean, is it, is it, is it hard to be a public figure and a role model for kids? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, is a, it is difficult, but um, I don't know. My my mom's a teacher. She's a or she was. She's a she's a fifth grade teacher for a really long time. And even before then, she was this. She's kind of. I don't want to use the word prude, but like swear words were not okay in her house. And like even saying shut up to my sister was considered like really bad. So my mom, I think, is my first reader in my head. Like if if I write something that's gonna make my mom mad, she's gonna be upset, and I don't want my mom to be upset. So as a as as a result of that, I think my work just became really PG. Like, I wanted to make work that my mom would be okay reading. And she's not a big comics reader, but she loves my comics. So I feel like, yes, I've, I've gotten audience member number one satisfied. Um, and, and maybe it's just the person she is, and that's part of the person I became. Like, I really like kids. I really like talking with kids. I really like relating to kids. I like hearing their stories. And so, so making something that they can relate to feels really amazing. And before I started doing this, there was this common sentiment, I think, that like kids didn't really read comics anymore, and especially girls didn't really have an interest in comics. So being part of a movement that has proved them wrong has been amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
which I think sets up your next question really well. Yes. Actually. Yeah, I'm smiling at that, feeling yeah. pretty smug myself. Uh, okay. So, um, I mean, we're I, pulling I, back the curtain here for you guys today. Right. <laughs> so, all right, now we're going to talk about audiences and how people talk about your work. Um, I mean, I have I have seen people talk about your work as like you know, books for girls, and I have actually seen your fans like librarians and, and well-intentioned adults ask you um, questions like, well, first I'll give you a compliment about <laughs> your books, telling you how much like. Some, some, like a lot of their, their kids love your books. And then they'll ask you to, um, or they'll sort of wish aloud that you would do books for boys. Um, I mean, do you think that your books are for girls specifically? And, and what do you think when you get that question about, would you make <laughs> some books for boys, please? When, when people say, Raina, are you ever going to read a book for a boy? I go, yeah, here you go. Mm -hmm. And I hand them sisters, and then I drop the mic. <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's tricky because we, we live in a really stigmatized society where books about girls are for girls and books about boys are for girls and boys. Mm -hmm. um, that's the way that a lot of us were raised. That's the that's stigma that a lot of us are somehow comfortable with as adults. Um, I started noticing this when I was making mini comics and I would go to shows like Mocha and the male readers who were huge fans of my mini comics, the minute that the Babysitter's Club book started being published, they were like, eh, 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 no, no, no. Like, I love your work. Your work is amazing. I love all this autobio you've written about your childhood, but I am not touching the Babysitter's Club. Too girly. Mm -hmm. too, too much not for me. And a friend of mine read it, and he commented to another friend. He didn't tell me this directly, but I heard about it later roundabout, that he said, I feel really uncomfortable like being able to relate to these 12-year-old girls. So, so really, something's just broken here, and I don't, I don't think that, <laughs> I don't think that any one person can fix that. But I will say too that, yeah, you're right. I get asked that question all the time. Are you ever going to write a book for boys? Are you ever going to write a book about a boy? Are you ever going to write books that will appeal to my boy students? It is never the boys themselves who are asking me that question. Right. I was going to say the boys themselves are lined up with the girls, and like these little macho jockey twelve-year-old boys will be like. You saw my copy of Drama, and I'm like, I'm like, yeah, is this your favorite book? And they're like, yeah, it's cool. And I'm like, awesome. So what, what is it that you like about this book in particular? And they're like, I don't know, it's just good. And like, they don't, <laughs> they don't have an answer. But I mean, <laughs> and like, Drama is the one with the pink cover and the girl with the heart above her head. So I love that. But I mean, it could be because there are more more bro boy protagonists in that book than any of my other books. I have no idea. Or, I mean, I think kids just like stories about kids and kids who relate to one another and kids who talk to one another and have fears and have anxieties. Um, I think anxiety is probably the theme that runs through all of my books the strongest. And I know that a lot of kids suffer from it. And it's not something that we're able to talk very much about. So books that address it, books that bring it right into a character that they can relate to, I think is a powerful thing. So I'm just gonna keep writing comics about how I'm nervous about everything. I think <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that is how I will continue. It's a common denominator. Um, Go boys. <laughs> and so girls. I, I, I know a particular set of um, ang anxious people and they are cartoonists. Um, so I'm gonna, ask, <laughs> I'm gonna ask this question for them. Um, any, any advice for uh, emerging writers and cartoonists? I chose this slide <laughs> to, um, <laughs> to illustrate the fact that in, when I was two, I was amazing at drawing, as you can see. Um, and I'm sure you guys were all this amazing when you were two as well. Um, but I never stopped. And so drawing every day, drawing in a diary every day, drawing sketches and drawing comics, obviously I've gotten a little bit better. I wouldn't say I've gotten too much better, but there's, there's, a, there's an improvement arc. Um, I don't have to tell you guys to keep doing it, right? Like everybody here is probably here because they like to draw and because they want to make comics. Um, I started making comics in the late 90s and early aughts, and so we did not have access back then to Tumblr and to Kickstarter and to Patreon and all of these amazing tools now that you guys have to take advantage of. I was only able to get my comics in front of people's faces because I Xeroxed my minis and literally threw them into their faces. So whatever exposure you can get is great. Whatever peer feedback you can get is great. Um, having something like CCA here as a resource is amazing. 
<clears throat> you guys are so lucky. <coughs> Excuse me. I mean, just go to Zine Fest. Just go to, well, Ape is down in San Jose now. Thank you. But um, yeah, there's, there's so many places now and ways to get into comics. And I'm, I'm so happy that they exist and wish that they had existed when I was a kid, but it, maybe it made me have to work a little harder. Um, put your social media away for a while. Ah, that's a big one. Um, I used to draw because I was bored and I missed my friends and I wanted to see them and talk to them. So that was what made me want to draw stories about them. And now I can talk to my friends anytime I want to because my phone is always in my pocket. So uh, use Freedom for Mac if you can. Um, I don't know if there's the equivalent for an iPhone to just like shut it off yeah. for eight hours and just get some work done. But I know one thing is that uh, it's, it's becoming a tradition now to like go on little retreats with groups of friends and to get away from the world for a little while. So uh, I went camping with T last year and we didn't have access to the internet for two days. Man, it was great. We, we had a good time. Um, and so, so you, I don't know, it's like you got to cut yourself off sometimes and it can be a really wonderful one we do. Is that... Do you have any advice, T? I, I always feel like I'm just rambling when I give uh, it. No, I mean, I can give <laughs> advice, but I mean, the thing about teaching comics is that I just give all this advice that I don't take myself, you know? <laughs> I mean, I'm just telling right. you all the things that I wish I did. These are aspirational things like, yes, turn off your social media. <laughs> <laughs> do I do that? No. Um, and <laughs> do I draw more when I do? Yes. Um, I do think about like, drawing comics sometimes like on good days, like on bad days for me, it's like, oh, just, and, you know, I draw so slowly and <laughs> nothing comes out right. And then on good days, it does feel like, like writing little love letters to my loved ones. And yeah, it works better if I miss them and I'm and, and, and not like, you know, texting with them all the time. <laughs> um, uh, oh, my last question for you before we do a do our little next thing is um are there any uh new comics or other books that you're excited about right now yes i felt like if i if i could recommend some books that are coming out uh these are three books that are coming out in the fall of 2017 so they'll all be out very soon the first one is pashmina by nidhi chanani faculty member here it's coming out from first second books i've read it it's awesome it's about a girl who discovers a magical pashmina in her mom's closet and then it basically allows her to transport herself to India to learn about her history, and then she gets to go and visit for real. And uh, it's really awesome, and it's coming out soon. I'm jealous I haven't gotten to read it yet. Oh, it I read it in gorgeous. thumbnails. It was awesome. Um, the next is The Witch Boy by Molly Ostertag, which is coming out from Scholastic Graphics in October, which just got optioned by, I think, Fox Animation. Um, oh. Yeah, and it's, it's the story of a young boy named Aster, and uh, he's a boy, so they tell him that he's going to be a shapeshifter. And only girls are allowed to be witches, so Aster really wants to be a witch. And um, it's the story of him learning how him being him will help save the day. And finally, I have to, um, I'm not actually sure how to pronounce this. Does anybody know? Is it, is it Mish Mishadra? That would be my guess. I haven't, I haven't uh, actually heard it pronounced. I've just seen it written by Yasmin Omar Atta. It's coming out from Gallery 13, which is an imprint of Simon & Schuster. And it is about, um, it's, it's based on the true story of the author dealing with uh, being diagnosed with epilepsy and trying just to be sort of a normal Arab Amer American teenager who is in college. So it's like balancing this, this normal side of his life with the fact that he is also epileptic. And um, it looks amazing and I cannot wait to read it. So those are the three that I would suggest and that is the end of my slides. So now. Okay. That was our Q&A, but we've got something a little bit more um, dynamic for you tonight. Um, I'm just going to move this table back. And uh, Raina's going to show off them comics muscles. Yeah, <laughs> muscles. So. Um, I think I'll just, I'll just get some prompts from you guys. I want to do a setting. So I need an idea for a place. What do you think of idea for a place? Los Angeles. OK. Now I need two objects that you would never think of finding in Los Angeles. Like totally. What do you think? It's an object. Malls? 
No, there's definitely malls in Los Angeles. But like, what would you find at a mall? Like an object, like a thing. Do you have an idea for a thing? A volcano. Okay, I like it. Okay, now one other thing. Yes. An elephant. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, so we have Los Angeles and an elephant and volcanoes. Um, okay. I, uh, no, no colors. I mean, maybe we'll use the red for some lava flow, but um, I guess we will draw like a circus going through the streets of Los Angeles. And let me tell you guys that there is a reason why I draw people and not animals. Uh, for my comics. It's because I'm not so skilled at the, aw, I know, I can do cute, but I can't do, like, anything else. <laughs> Actually, my, my favorite Disney movie is Dumbo, so, like, I have a little bit of an advantage when it comes to elephants over other types of animals, I think, but... Yeah? <laughs> think I did okay? Well, thank you. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. All right. Um... Mrs. Jumbo, she has that little thing on her head. Yay. Um, okay, what's, a, what's another thing you would never, ever see? Like another animal you would never see in a circus. Never see in a circus. A cheetah. A cheetah, okay. Yeah, I don't think you see too many cheetahs in circuses, but uh, we're going to put one in this circus. What does a cheetah have? Is it, is it uh, spots? Yeah. Okay, see, here's where, here's where things really start to fall apart. <laughs> yes, it does look like a cat. Thank you. Um, well, once I put the spots on, it'll be very obvious that it's not a cat. It's a cheetah. Um, yeah, so people. Let's draw some people next time. It looks like a, a cat, but it also kind of looks like a walrus and like a, I don't know. You'd think that all those um, years reading Calvin and Hobbes, I would have figured out a little bit more about how big crazy cats look, but nope. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, and now let's do one more animal of some sort. Uh, octopus. octopus, I love it, okay. So we're gonna put the octopus in a tank. This is the equivalent, I guess, to like the circus wagon thingy. Is, I'll, just, I'll just write circus. So no one is mistaken that it's anything but a circus. Okay, and then, oh, I should put little hats on everybody, like we had on Mrs. Jumbo. Okay, um, the octopus will also have a hat. All right, one, <laughs> two, <laughs> three, uh-oh, <laughs> four, <laughs> five, <laughs> Oh, some background tentacles. Six. Here, we'll shade them so that you can tell they're in the back. Okay. Seven. And eight. This is why I wear the brace on my hand, because drawing eight tentacles is tiresome. And then... Suction cups. You can't have an octopus without suction cups. Oh, here, I'll make him holding a flag. <laughs> wow, I don't usually get to draw on such a big canvas like this. This is awesome. Okay, so his hat. <laughs> we need some bubbles. Oops, not on his head, on the tank. Silly. Here, I'll, I'll put him like mostly in the water, but slightly out of it. And then some splashies up here. Well, I guess if I was gonna draw a comic, this would be better. I'm now thinking about like the story that's going on here and it's starting to concern me. Um, okay, so, so then we're gonna draw some people who are very excited about the circus coming to town. And I'm just like indicating them very loosely. This is what I do when I, when I thumbnail my comics is I just kind of like, draw super fast and just indicate what's back there. What do, what do we see in the streets of Los Angeles? Uh, homeless people. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's do a hobo. 
Yep, totally offensive. <laughs> yep, there are. It's true. So, so he's got a little. Well, he's just like a hillbilly homeless person. He's got the little. Uh, <laughs> he's sitting on a little chair. He's just. He's like a tourist, you know. He's just. He's like on a beach day. Uh, well, I'll draw his tent back here too. Okay, so that's how you know he's homeless. He's still having a great time. So yay, the circus is in town. Cool. Um, I haven't been to Los Angeles in like six months, so I forget what's there besides homeless people. Is there, what kind of stores would there be? What? Food drugs. I thought you said food drugs, and I was like, no. <laughs> food, oh yeah, the theater. Uh, that's too hard. Okay, oh no, no, no. I won't draw the Chinese theater. I'll draw um, just like a marquee. Yeah. What movie should be playing at the marquee? Wonder Woman. I don't know. I think we got a lot of votes for Harry Potter. That might just uh. Okay. My favorite movie. Actually, I went to, um, was anybody else at this? The um, San Francisco Symphony was doing like a retrospective of John Williams's music last night. Um, and he played like E.T. and he played a bunch of Star Wars stuff. He wasn't there, it was just the orchestra. But when they played Harry Potter, like I broke into like chills and I wanted to start spontaneously crying because it was so awesome. And it was, they just played one song from Harry Potter, but it was, I wish that it was like a whole thing of just Harry Potter music. So, all right, so there's the circus coming to Los Angeles and there's people in the streets. They're so happy because they love the circus. Oh my goodness. Um, you guys know what's coming. Harry Potter, oh, fine, fine, fine. <laughs> okay, there's a the little box office. My arm hurts so bad right now, you guys. <laughs> Harry Potter. Exactly, tell me which one. Uh, Harry Potter and the... And the Order of the Phoenix, first one I heard. The Order of the Phoenix. P-H-O-E, right? You have it in your bag, is that how you knew that? Sweet. All right, Marquis. I'll just put Wonder Woman over here. I mean, it's, there's gotta be like a matinee too. So then I gotta, oh my God, you guys are gonna make me work my butt off up here. <laughs> so many lights. Oh, I know, we'll put an In-N-Out burger next to it. <laughs> Man, does anybody else wanna come up here and draw these for me? Yeah. Like these lights? Yeah. Oh my gosh, you have to be tall though. Who's the tallest person here? Um, uh, you, you're like, nope, not me. Uh, you're, you look pretty tall, you wanna come up and draw? Um, uh, here is a black marker. You get to draw the little lights on the marquee while I uh, continue with the in and out burger. Oh man, okay. I, I, how does the thing go? That way? Wait, that way? The air. If I get it wrong, we'll just call it something else. Like that? Like double back burger? Yeah. Okay. And then it has those little palm tree things, right? In theory, I need to write in and out, but I'm not going to because I don't want to get sued for copyright infringement. So, okay, so, the, but the thing is like, you guys can all tell what it is, right? Just from looking at that, that's enough. That's what's awesome about comics is that, okay, I don't really want to hear your answer. So uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding, you guys. Um, so, <laughs> but what's cool about comics is you can just kind of indicate stuff and people get it, right? Yeah. Okay. You, no. <laughs> no, okay, fine. Okay, double back in and out, cool. So, um, 
we're just going to make some other boring buildings back here that are just like Los Angeles. Woohoo. Give them some deco details. Oh, thank you. You've done such an amazing job on that marquee. I love it. Okay, and now the world is about to end because there is a exploding volcano that is going to be coming right on down. Oh, thank you. We've got red. Good. However, however, did you guys figure it out? He's going to save the day because he's got a tank full of water. Yay! <laughs> do you want to color it in red? Or do you want me to do it? She's like, I can't reach that high. Yes. You asked first. So actually stand on that thing. Yeah, go for it. Okay, we're going to sign our names on here. Um, so, Raina T, you can sign your name. Thank you guys for your help. This is awesome. Well, we're going to be here a while because I put a lot of lava in that. Um, my, oh, you, <laughs> I have a better idea. I can just stand in front of that part because I'm wearing a red shirt. How about that? I can just, yeah, you can write your name. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I'll do that part because I'm taller. Thank you, guys. You guys can have a seat if you so wish. I will continue with the... Oh, yeah. Wait, come back up so T can take a picture. Please. Can you pause for one second? Okay. Oh, no. Okay. I'm covering the homeless person. Oh, man. Okay. Here, I'll go over here. Yeah. Thank you, guys. If you want to or you can stop, I can do it. You can have a seat. Let's well, hear well, for Raina, Ellie, and Amelie. 